I will, I will speak loudly. <laughs> and uh, well, thank you very much for your kind introductory words. Uh, I will add to this that uh, I have now stepped out of party politics. Uh, I'm still a very political person. I've been all my life. But now I'm operating in a different context. Uh, I'm still a member, or I have newly become a member of the so-called ECRI Commission of the Council of Europe, which uh, monitors uh, human rights, uh, especially with regard to uh, racism in the Council of Europe uh, uh, states. And then after I stepped out of Althingi a year ago, uh, I've been uh, operating on my own, a soldier of the grassroots, so to speak. I've been organizing meetings in Reykjavik on various issues that uh, uh, are burning on society, or I feel should be burning on society, uh, from uh, the TISA and the GATS agreements to home care for the elderly, things like that. But uh, most of all, uh, and I'm not saying this only jokingly, I'm a full-time grandfather. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I say that uh, for the first time in my life, I feel I'm doing something really useful. <laughs> uh, gathering my, my grandchildren after school, uh, they come uh, with me to my home, and we have a, what we call a reading circle. And this is not a reading circle uh, I was acquainted with in the late 60s and early 70s, where the right wing was reading Hayek and Friedman and Buchanan, and the left wing Marx and Engels and Mandel and, and the like. Now, our reading material is soft, and uh, we talk together and listen to good music, and we hopefully learn how to engage in in a constructive uh, discussion where people are taught to be skeptical, but in a constructive way. And this uh, is my very much in line with how I conceive politics. Politics, in my mind, is not only a power game. It is, uh, it is uh, primarily the fight about the way society thinks, the way society thinks. My father was a conservative. I am a left-winger. But when I come to think of it, we are saying very much the same things, he in the 1960s and I in, uh, in these uh, uh, last uh, two, three decades. Why? The political spectrum has moved. It has moved to the right. And how has this done? How, how has, has this happened? Well, there are various, of course, reasons uh, for this. But, uh, but the important point is this. Uh, 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 politics is about the way pol uh, uh, society thinks, what it allows politicians to do. I think this is a very important uh, uh, point. And now I am operating outside all political structures, but uh, concentrating on issues. Uh, I was uh, intended to give a talk on Saturday, not today. I arrived only this morning uh, after going very, very late to bed, sleeping only one hour. And Mark said that uh, I was intended to speak today, which I thought was not very good, but come to think of it, it is quite all right. Because uh, my talk is in the making in line with the world I'm trying to describe. I'm, I'm describing a world which is rethinking itself. And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, how I'm going to proceed. Uh, in a seminar form where we discuss and I uh,
put forward some considerations for you to, to uh, then uh, 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 react to. Now, there is a joke from Ireland where a, where a traveler is lost. He has lost his ways. And he asks uh, a farmer he meets how to, how to uh, proceed to Dublin. He wants to go to Dublin. And the farmer thinks about this and says, you want to go to Dublin? Then I would not start from here. Now, what is our point of departure? That's much better music, don't you think? Uh, what is our uh, what is our uh, point of departure? What, where where are we now finding ourselves in the process of history? I contend that we find ourselves in an age which I would describe as uh, the age of uh, disillusionment, skepticism, disbelief, disillusionment, and. Uh, when I try to put my life into a historical perspective, I feel that I have touched on three epochs. I'm born, I was born in 1948. And the first uh, epoch I experienced was the phasing out of uh, colonialism, of colonialism. Uh, the 19th century had uh, been characterized by uh, especially European dominance throughout uh, large parts of the world, in Asia, Africa, and elsewhere. And these uh, uh, countries were gaining independence uh, when I was uh, coming to life. And uh, some a little later, but uh, this was the period of facing out of colonialism. I myself come from Iceland which was a colony, which was part of the Danish kingdom until 1944. Uh, now, even if colonialism was phasing out, uh, it, of course, was still with us and is still with us. And we are constantly living with the consequences of colonialism. We only have to look at the map, the world map, Africa, Middle East, large parts of Asia, where the borders are like a ruler, which is no surprise because they were made by a ruler, notoriously by Sykes and Pico in, uh, in uh, 1916, 17, secretly first and then becoming public, how, the, how they dis divided the Middle East between dominance areas uh, by the British and Fran Fran French especially. And there were other, other instances of this. And this, 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 uh, this, uh, this drawing up of the world map is still, of course, with us all the time now. And, uh, and although this was in the, in the, in the 19th century, and as I say, it was phasing out in the, in the middle of the 20th century, this colonialism in the, in the 19th century mold, I said that it still is with us. I'll give an example. Uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War, <clears throat> we had the construction of the Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the capitalist world had been hoping to go still further, but they couldn't at that time. Uh, this, uh, the, 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 the latter half of the 20th century is characterized, internationally speaking, in, uh, by trade agreements on tariffs, GATT, General Agreement on uh, tariffs and, and uh, trade and tariffs. So, uh, lowering of tariffs was the, the, the issue. But in the middle of the 90s, 1990s, we have a different direction where the world community, the world capitalist community, starts to look 
inward and make demands to uh, each individual state to open their borders, their societies for investment, for international finance investment. And this was GATS, organized within the framework of the, the WTO, World Trade Organization. And uh, this, as all these agreements were made in great secrecy, there had been attempts within, uh, by, the, by, the, uh, by the OECD in, a, in the same uh, vein, the May Agreement in the mid-1990s, multilateral agreement on investment, which came to an end when it was uh, revealed what was really happening. Then it, then it stopped. It was France, which was in the forefront of these, uh, uh, these May uh, 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 negotiations. But when it was revealed what this really meant, uh, then it came to an end. I will tell you one issue which was very much debated in France at the time. Uh, according to this agreement, and this is the essence of GATS as well, uh, society which decides to support one uh, competitor on the market must give equal agreement to all. So, if France was supporting French uh, film companies, it would have to give same treatment to American film companies operating in, in France. This is, this is the idea. This is the idea of GATS as well, General Agreement on Trade and Services. And this is the big fight that has been going on since the mid-1990s. Uh, came to an end after the Doha round, which started in 2001. It was held in Doha because, uh, well, it had been, there had been meetings in Seattle. You remember the meetings in Seattle when, when you had all the big demonstrations? And then they went to Doha. Why? Because there's a lot of sand there, and it's difficult to get there. And uh, this is how they wanted to proceed with these negotiations, always in secrecy, always in secrecy. Now, why am I mentioning this here? I'm mentioning this in the context of colonialism. And, uh, and after, you see, because it came to a halt, because of the opposition from trade union movements throughout the world and the poorer countries of the world, which did not want to open up their societies on these premises at all. So it came to a halt. What happens then? Then the rich part of the world organizes a different round behind the curtains. This is TISA. And these are all these agreements which are being discussed these days, TISA, TTIPs, uh, Transatlantic, Trans-Pacific Agreement, CETA, agreement between Canada and, uh, and uh, Canada and the European Union, etc. And this is, this is all in the same vein. And they were hoping, these are 50 countries out of 123 uh, of the GATS countries, I think they are, 50 richest countries, among them the 29 uh, European Union countries, and then the United States and, and, and uh, Australia, Canada, etc. 50 richest countries wanted to make an agreement and then, then face the rest of the world with that, fait accompli. That's the idea. This I mention because I see this, this as part of colonial domination. This, the essence is the same, although the mold is different. And this leads to the second epoch I wanted to mention when I when I place my life or lifetime in, in, in a historical uh, perspective. And this, of course, is the Cold War period between the capitalist world and the communist world, East and West, NATO, Warsaw Pact. And this had tremendous impact on all uh, political discourse throughout the world. I remember this. Uh, being a, a socialist, so you're a socialist. You want to send us all to concentration camps in Siberia. 
You see, although people who did not identify at all with authoritarian regimes, calling them socialist, were always for, forced into that mold. That was the discussion. But the, 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 the good thing about it was that there was this moral element, this dimension concerning human rights, etc., which was also part of this, this big debate of the mid uh, 20th century, which then came to an end after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, the, the Soviet uh, bloc. And, uh, and then, uh, then all this has changed, although people do not always notice. I said I had been uh, in the Council of Europe. I was for several years a member of the parliamentary uh, assembly of the Council of Europe. And uh, I was in a political group there. There were political groupings there. Uh, and I was in a group called the United Left. Then you had the Social Democrats, and then you had conservatives, two groups of them. And would you believe who were in the same conservative group in the Council of Europe? political uh, party fellows of Theresa May and Boris Johnson and Vladimir Putin. Are, he is not in my group. He is in the right-wing group, of course. So the world is changing. The political world is changing, although we are still operating with old instruments and have not adapted to a new world at all. And then I come to this, what I call the epoch of disillusionment. Uh, why, do I, why do I say this? First, let me say that uh, the 20th century, despite two world wars, despite famines, despite calamities, despite breach of human rights on enormous scale, it was an age of progress. And what is more, most of us believed there was progress. We were proceeding forward. Progress was the measurement we, we looked at. Are we, are we getting closer to a better, better life? And we believed it was. And still in 2000, in the year 2000, when Kofi Annan put forward his uh, principle of, of responsibility to protect Kofi Annan, the general secretary of the, of the UN. We, we took this very welcomingly. I, I did. I believed now something is, 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 is coming positive. Then you got, of course, Iraq. You got Libya. You've got Syria, regime change, where this instrument is used or power politics is put in this political wrapping. I have not departed from this idea at all. And I was looking, I've been following uh, how people have been trying to develop this principle. Brazil, for instance, with, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with, with their with their, uh, 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 with their uh, ideas and proposals. Uh, but now skepticism is seeping in. Skepticism is seeping in, also in my mind. And I think we must find ways of rethinking everything rethinking everything. If we only had got rid of NATO when the Warsaw Pact was, was uh, abolished, that in my mind would have been a good idea. I think so. NATO has changed in character. It did towards the end of the 1990s. NATO was organized in such a way, or should operate in such a way, an attack on one is an attack on all. Then there is a change which says 
This is in the in the in the meeting in Washington, 50 years uh, birthday or NATO anniversary. Threat to one is threat to all. Who is most likely to be threatened in the world? The aggressors of the colonial part? I think so. And we are all there with them unconditionally. Iceland couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, uh, protest against the, the attacks on Syria because it was condoned by NATO. We are there. So I'm saying, like, I step out of the party political structure, we must reconsider the function of, of all institutions. I remember uh, when I was a journalist covering the, the, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan towards the end of 1979. I was up in the mountains north of Peshawar. And I was uh, interviewing the freedom fighters. Freedom fighters. Talibans. Our friends. The Talibans. And then I read an interview by Brzezinski, the security uh, advisor to, uh, to Carter, who died last, sp uh, last spring, just under a year ago. There was an interview with him in uh, a French periodical, uh, Observateur Nouvelle, Nouvelle Observateur. I'm not French speaking. And uh, uh, where he says, contrary to what I was told at the time as a journalist, we, of course, were in Afghanistan before the Soviets. And when the Soviets invaded uh, Afghanistan, who went with their armies over the borders, I wrote a note to Carter saying, congratulations, now they will have, the Russians, the Soviets will have their Vietnam War. And they, they did for nine years. So it was there, of course, I'm not disillusioned in, that, in the sense uh, that uh, the world, of course, has always been dominated by power politics of this kind, but now things are getting clearer, I feel. And in this interview I am referring to, uh, Brzezinski is asked, and you were supporting Talibans, or the, the equivalent you know, of Talibans. I don't know if they, he called them Talibans in, the, in that interview. He said, yes, of course, and no regrets, asked the reporter. Of course not. What is more important? Uh, the Taliban's support of the Taliban's or the fall of the Soviet Empire, judged on a his, on a, in, in a historical world uh, uh, perspective. And this again, and now I'm getting to the f to the present, when we have been looking at Syria, for instance, where the West. Even after seeing all the pictures of beheaded people, having seen people being uh, thrown, homosexuals of, uh, uh, of, of uh, high-rise buildings to, uh, killed, young people crucified, we have been supporting this. We've been supporting this. Why? Because it serves power politics of the old colonial times. So I'm saying, I think we should become very, very, you know, take this discussion about the United Nations, about the international organizations we have constructed, and re-examine them. And the Security Council, of course, is a completely outdated idea, completely. It's based on the power, it's based on the principle of power politics. When people are calling for the international community to intervene in, uh, in Syria, 
responsibility to protect. Who, who, what is the international community to, to intervene and, and negotiate about Syria? The king of Saudi Arabia? Donald Trump? Iran, Hezbollah? Uh, Germany? France? Britain? International community. Are we calling for this? Of course not. How did the Vietnam War end? The Americans left. They left. So, I'm saying new structures, new questions. Let's step out of the old frameworks and think anew. Thank you. some moments to ask some questions. Um, yes. Just a remark, just to continue your thoughts. Please. Yes, yes. Because uh, we both, uh, my colleague and I, I mean, we also talked about this, politics and, the, and mediation in politics, because mm -hmm. there's something missing. Um, we've got, of course, power politics, mm -hmm. which is a very patriarchal element, what about uh, left and right? Uh, both can be very patriarchal. What about working in politics more with universal human values, ethics? So get rid of right and left. Or what is your idea about this? Yes. Uh, I, I, although I've stepped out of party politics, I yeah. still regard myself as a leftist, yeah. uh, socialist, leftist. But... Uh, uh, I agree with you that we should not, we should try to s stop being dogmatic, ask about uh, content, and, uh, and uh, yes, I, I, I simply would agree with that, that uh, this is part of the revaluation I am, I am calling for, because as you say, uh, if we if we simply look at parties and structures and never question the content, we will discover that structures are not to be trusted. No structures are be, to be uh, uh, trusted. It's only, uh, uh, it's only what I'm trying to achieve in my reading circle at home. There are eight, nine, and ten years. You know, let's Let's discuss and and uh, let's let's be free to 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 work for a, for a good just uh, solution. And I think I think part of this is of course left right. You know, not to not to stick to states or political parties just because they say they are something uh, they probably are not. Let's look for what politicians and structures and parties do, not only what they say, what they do. And may I say something else? About yes. You say politics is how society thinks. Yes. But what I'm missing there a little bit is also what society fears, because a part of empathy, we talked about this also before, is lacking in society. Also mm -hmm. other, other people, as you say, in Syria and Iraq, Yes. Yes, Actually. yes. I will tell you. In, in uh, education, for example, you don't have that enough. Well. Uh, and yet, maybe in Iceland. No, it's, it's, I remember I, I met a little girl from uh, an Icelandic girl living in the um, United States 10 years ago. And I asked her, what do you want to do when you grow older? And she said, well, I think it is difficult to live in the modern world if you don't master arithmetic. And I am very good at teaching arithmetic. So this is what I want to do. And I sat there and my jaw uh, dropped. I hadn't heard this for many years. She was actually talking, you know, this was in the in the neoliberal boom, 
about you know the, the the social value of her work her possible contribution and i felt this so refreshing to hear another little story when i came home after studying in britain this was just before uh, margaret thatcher came to uh, the throne i was going to say came to power and uh, i i remember i was i was living then or thinking in in a time past when I, as a reporter, was always, always predicting her downfall. That was after unemployment went from half a million to a million, to a million and a half, two million, two million and a half, three million, but she stayed in power. And then I thought, something has changed. Because the millions in work where, where there were more people in work so there was something that had changed in the direction you are referring to empathy or, or thinking in a socially responsible way and uh, that is the big catastrophe of, of, of our times neoliberalism you see I, I, I was referring to my father who was a conservative in the, in the old mold he would never have thought along these lines. I mean, we would disagree about the about market mechanisms, to what extent they should be should apply, where, etc. Uh, but but he would never have gone so far as to want to uh, to go into the hospital wards or or, or, or the the primary schools and, and marketize this. Not at all. But this is what changed. And, and this changed after the cultivating work done in the 80s by the neoliberalists. Now I'm getting political again. Uh, when, you see, we had our lot uh, to Iceland. Buchanan came, Friedman came, Hayek came. They all came to cultivate the ground. There came nobody from the left. They were dead. They were finished. And they prepared the ground, and now we are having the products on our tables. This is what I say, and this is why I want a more balanced society, inclusiveness, and uh, and. Uh, so if you, if you can talk of left, right in those uh, terms, I'm, I'm not really doing that, you know. I, I'm, 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 I'm referring to values you are mentioning more than hardcore political dogma. If you could introduce yourself and... Oh, uh, no problem. Or British or 
U.S. government that is being represented. It's not for the international community yes, to yes. represent yeah. those things. So the, the, if, if you have a universal charter, as I think uh, as far as I remember in 1914, uh, San Francisco was adopted, was hmm. even signed by Maastricht. If that has been established, then keep to it, despite whether Trump or Bush or uh, Obama is being president, but okay, is this resolution serving justice mm -hmm. or not? Mm -hmm. Despite whoever is in, in, yes. in, in, in politically charged in, in, in the country. Yes. It is indeed a, a political activity. Yes. It's always party politics. Yes. And it has nothing to do mm. at all with, with, with uh, the, the, the international community or the just or justice. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Also because it's not transparent at all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I I I I, th I think there is reason to fear now that the United Nations are probably not coming to an end, but in very very serious trouble. I think very serious trouble. Yes, yeah, yeah. I've seen something like that. You know, could, uh, the interest of the United States and uh, other countries uh, to against the Kurdish in both cities, in both areas, yes. uh, for their rights. Yeah. The, the, yes, well, uh, I've been following the Kurdish question uh, quite uh, well, mainly inside uh, Turkey. I've been uh, part of uh, what is called the Imrali delegation. This was a delegation of journalists and and politicians who went to uh, Turkey to demand to see uh, Ozalan, who has been kept on Imrali Island since yes. And uh, and we went uh, we went to uh, southeastern uh, Turkey. And then a few weeks ago there was a tribunal in Paris in the vein of the Bertrand Russell tribunals, but this time on the Kurds, mainly I inside uh, Turkey. And uh, the verdict will be presented in Brussels uh, uh, next week, uh, which, is, which is good, you know, to, to, to get this into the, the forefront. I know less about the, the Iraqi side, except I, uh, uh, an Icelander a professor uh, of psychology who lives in Iceland now. He was the spokesman of Iraqi Kurds in Germany in the 1960s and very wrote a lot about uh, Kurds and the Kurdish questions. And this is why all Icelanders are very, have very followed the, the you know, Kurdish affairs with, with great interest. And, and uh, then, of course, there, there are these differences between emphasis among Iraqi Kurds and Turkish Kurds, but of course we should just look at the democratic rights. Uh, yes, John. Yes. My name is Richard Achanbon from Ghana. Uh, mine is an observation and also a question. Observation in terms of uh, Accepting your conclusion of the disillusionment, the political space mm -hmm. at the moment by the global public, and it's resulting uh, from how we say the 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 effect of uh, over politicization of the 
national governance institutions, uh, especially the United, the United Nations. And the further has been rendered weak by the Security Council. And so the, what you mentioned, which was corroborated by my colleague, in the area of responsibility to protect, mm -hmm. it's been a facade. Mm -hmm. And it's effective only when uh, one of the uh, political big ways has interest and the other does it. Mm -hmm. Where both have interest, then it becomes a big problem. Mm -hmm. And the example is what we are witnessing in Syria. Yes. So what do you think is the way forward? How can the world deal with this situation? Because yeah. we, we have a situation where conflicts are deepening in areas where the, the power blocks have interests. Mm -hmm. and the interests are not synchronized. Mm -hmm. So how do we go beyond this? Yes, I, I, I of course do not have the answer. And this is why I was so glad that I hadn't finished my, my talk, you know, because I don't have the answers, of course. But I think the question is to know your starting point. I, I, one of my favorite philosophers is John Stuart Mill. And since I am a combination of three, three trends, anarchism against authority, socialism, social justice, and uh, liberalism in the in the vein of John Stuart Mill, every man shall be free as long as he doesn't harm others. And then we start. What does it mean not to harm others? Can I then eat cocaine until I start beating people around me? Or wh where do we draw the lines, you know, harming others? My point is this. I don't know. This is the... This is the this is a matter for democratic society to discuss. We only know the starting point. We know where to start, and then we proceed how we do it. I think Kofi Annan's idea, principle of responsibility to protect, is a good one. It's a good one. It is not working. It's misused, being misused. Libya, the situation has never been worse. People are sold on actions, you know, refugees in, Lib in, in Libya. Uh, we know what's happening in, in, in Syria, of course, where, where people keep talking about a civil war. You know, it's, it's an invaded country. That's what it is. And, uh, and so I, my answer is this. Let us look critically at the international institutions, the United Nations in particular, with the Security Council, and we see they are abusing these very fine thoughts of Kofi Annan. And I think we, uh, the Security Council must disappear, I think. Uh, we must, uh, we must uh, re-establish the United Nations in a much more democratic way. And the results will be different. I think so. questions um, as uh, we do transition on to the next, uh, the carnival this evening at a uh, clip club, if I, I didn't read it, but I, I believe that that's what it says on the programs. So, uh, so we have some time to get over there. And once again, thank you very much. To, uh, thank you.